Right, hi everybody. I'm just letting people into the waiting room, so sorry if you've been kept waiting. But we're on to start three o'clock because we have to finish in plenty of time for the football, I'm told. So making sure that we um, get wrapped up from there. So look, we're really pleased that um, you've joined us for our third event with Bliss, talking about the Get In, per in Personal series and really addressing this whole cookie apocalypse, ad tech perfect storm, whatever you want to call it, the changes that we're seeing now with so much going on um, from all the different platforms. We're going to cover that in some detail from there. We've got a fantastic bunch of panellists um, to talk with us about this. Um, some housekeeping. We're recording this, so we'll share a video of the um, session afterwards. We'd love everyone to turn on, you know, to mute themselves. We don't get any background noise coming from there, so that, that would be great. We're going to have sort of space for Q&A at the end of the uh, session. We'll do that in the chat. So if you've got some questions from the chat, we'll get the panel to answer those. Um, we've got a getting personal hashtag on Twitter. So you can join in the conversation there as well. Um, we're working on sort of Chatham House rules. So, you know, you can talk about what people have said without, you know, addressing back their company from there. But otherwise, you know, we've had great fun on the previous two um, events we've had. We really got into the heart of this issue. Um, and I want to start with, you know, ask Aaron, who's um, the CTO of Bliss, just to actually, um, quick introduction of himself, but also to talk about the Bliss tracker that they've been looking at, you know, how traffic has changed with the ATT changes over the past few weeks since he went live. So Aaron, over to you. Hi, Simon. Thanks for the, the introduction. Um, hi, I'm Aaron. As, as Simon said, I'm the CTO of Bliss. Uh, I oversee our product development uh, technology teams, as well as a bit of a data geek. I've been in ad tech for God, probably over a decade at this point in time in various forms of, of performance advertising and uh, in the retargeting space and prospecting space and uh, now the location space. Um, with that said, I think one of the things we've been really closely paying attention to is, is how identity has been changing over all the sort of the, the, the macro changes that are, we're being faced with. You know, one of the earlier things that were rolling out was the iOS 14.5, 14.6 change, where people are now being asked to consent to be tracked across different applications. Uh, Kelly, could you pop up the, the tracker and maybe we can just give a, a brief snapshot of that for people who may not have, have seen it. So in the mobile advertising space, this is one of those groundswell changes that really affect how we, how we perform our day-to-day our -day jobs. And, and not just Bliss, but pretty much anybody that operates in the mobile application space. Uh, the expectation or the fear was that possibly uh, there would be a very small group of people choosing to opt in to be uh, tracked across applications. But I guess what we're seeing is, is it's not quite as, as, as chicken little, it's not quite as, as uh, this guy's not falling as hard as some people could anticipate. What we've been tracking, uh, there's, there's sets everywhere, uh, but what we've been specifically tracking is on the programmatic marketplaces that we listen to, which is you know effectively where we all sort of buy our inventory, it's all the RTB marketplaces globally that you know and love, what percentage of the volume of activity that we're seeing across those marketplaces that are arriving on one of these newer flavors of iOS uh, 14, where a, an IDFA or a maid is present, where that user is identifiable in a cross application, cross publisher sort of fashion. And, and so far what we're seeing at the, the adoption rate, we're seeing about 56% of the iOS volume of traffic that we see is now arriving with one of these new versions of iOS. So this is now sort of the norm. This is the the majority version of iOS out in the wild. So there was a long time, you can see on the left, it took a long time for um, Apple to sort of decide to, to finally push the go button on that. This was you know, the, the flat part of that was when people had to go and sort of find it themselves. And I think early June, people started to you know, push the up and, uh, against their will as it were and, and so forth. And what we're seeing, uh, Kelly, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, let's select the uh, the country, for example, uh, sorry, the global country. Um, we default to Canada, which is an important country, but a surprising default. Uh, if we go <laughs> to the global one, we see that around 47%, 48% of the traffic that we see across the programmatic marketplaces globally are arriving with an identity signal. This means we can frequency cap them, we can personalize them, we can measure them, um, at least across the, the, the inventory that we're seeing. Can we tease over into the, the into the UK, the GBR, uh, just to get a, a local flavor uh, top up? So, but we are seeing that this rate varies country by country. So in the UK, it's only around 
35% of traffic is arriving with one of these identifiers. In the US, it's a, it's a bit over 50%. What we've seen is over time, this, these numbers have, have been getting incrementally a little bit bigger because this is not necessarily a reflection of the true opt-in rate of, of human beings on their phone. It's a combination of specific apps that people are, are authorizing to, to track them, um, specific apps that are even beginning to ask that question, as well as in the number of ads available in those types of applications. So again, this is a, a measurement of the supply of ad inventory, not necessarily of devices or of people. I think you've seen stats from Flurry or apps, uh, app analytic other companies uh, that are saying it's something around 20% of people or 10% of people are choosing to opt in in general on specific applications. We're seeing the programmatic inventory space look a lot healthier. Now, admittedly, we're still losing most of the inventory, or at least a lot of the inventory. So in this case, we're missing out roughly 65% of the inventory where there's not an identity. So what we're seeing is that there's enough data here to use from a, a cohorting perspective, from an analysis or modeling or consumer panel perspective, but you wouldn't continue to operate in the iOS ecosystem as if nothing had changed, because something has changed. You're not gonna take a haircut of 65% off your reach of this premium iOS inventory uh, without trying to adjust the strategy to find ways of taking advantage of that. And I think part of these conversations are what are the best ways to take advantage of this sort of changing reality. Um, happy to answer any questions on that later, but Simon, let me turn it back over to you for a bit. Great, thank you, that's great. I think, yeah, a couple of things you get over really well there. Is one is it's taken a bit of time for this to sort of kick in because Apple sort of didn't push it and now they are pushing it. Um, and secondly, it's not as bad as people were expecting. And I think we get a general feeling, oh, you know, that's not too bad. I think it, your point is very well made that you know, we're losing the majority of the inventory we had. And um, so things are very different from there. And the one thing that's um, has sort of blown up in the past few days is obviously the Google decision to actually kick the can down the road a little bit and not withdraw cookies until the end of 2023. And I was quite interested that we saw the share price of trade desk spiked because I think the general view, oh great, we can carry on business as normal, but you can't carry on business as normal when a huge proportion of your traffic is missing from there. So I really want to bring the panel in and start talking with them about, you know, maybe what they're seeing, not trades per se, but what they're seeing with their clients or talking with their clients about whether money's moving on to Android and how people are coping with that. So Sandra, can we start with you first? You know, quick introduction, and then you know, what what impact are you seeing with your clients right now? Yep, thank you, Simon. Um, so I'm a strategist. Um, so I'm coming to this panel with a slightly different hat on, with a strategist hat, and also from a global perspective. So I think, what are we seeing? Um, seeing sort of a kind of difference in, in take up, so in adapting. So I think the impact of this change so far affects different industries in different ways. So if you're FMCG, it's very different from being in luxury, beauty, fashion, and so on. So um, where, for example, iOS would have had or still has an important role to play in those kind of more luxury fashion brands and 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 played a really important part for us so um i think we will need to move faster in those categories than we need to and obviously we need to adapt the strategies there um in other in other categories i think that the impact will be different and lessened and depends also what markets you're looking at you know as aaron pointed out you know the situation is very different from the uk from when they from the us and obviously um those kind of very low figures of the 35 percent that aaron was pointing about you know are, you know are significant and require a significant strategy change um that's less so in other markets that are less ios uh, focused or where the impact is lessened Right, because you can probably talk, talk to iOS traffic tends to be much more valuable for high end goods, doesn't it? It's, it's yeah. hugely disproportionate in some the markets you're yeah. talking about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So the, t the profile of, of iOS customers um, traditionally, although Android is, is, is gaining ground, has been young and, and art market. And so when we're thinking, oh, you know, we're working with brands that are targeting young and art market brands um, our audiences then obviously there's that the impact is much more severe that said android has been making inroads in those younger audiences and so on so that's you know we're in a better position than we would have been if we'd been in this boat five ten years ago um, but it is impacting some some audiences disproportionately and some clients disproportionately and that you know the, the rate of the need to adapt um, will therefore the need to be much greater and much faster 
Right, thank you. So Jeremy, let's come to you. Quick intro and uh, you know how you're seeing this with your clients right now. Sure. So um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jeremy Pounder. I um, head up uh, a team called Discovery uh, PhD. Um, so we look after the insights, marketing science, um, and we have a data and tech team um, as part of that, uh, that wider discovery team. Um, in terms of, of what we're seeing, I think um, we perhaps, you know, I don't think we've seen things fall off a cliff or things change you know, hugely radically. Um, I think we are seeing some um, greater investment in, in Android as a result of what, of what we've seen in the last few months um, and some money moving across um, because of obviously the, you know, the, the diminished targeting or particularly reporting capabilities. Um, I think it's not necessarily been hugely dramatic and that's partly because what we've seen is, is an extension of a, of a trend that's already been in place for some time. So I think we've already to some extent priced in, if you like, some of the um, uh, you know, diminished capabilities within the iOS environment. Um, I think the other thing probably to say is maybe similar to, to Sandra's point, um, in terms of the, the makeup of a lot of our clients, we've often historically been using iOS from a more of a branding perspective because of um, you know, the profile of, of the audience. So you know, in our case, upmarket autos, uh, Audi, for example, is, is, is a client who would have used iOS in that, in that regard. So you know, when we're using um, the platform in that regard, you know, some of the issues that we've seen um, around tracking aren't necessarily quite as significant. Um, and so I think maybe across the marketplace where money's moving, it's more for, it's more because of certain types of advertisers who have, who have lost out there and not necessarily the, the bigger, more established brands um, that typically make up the big agency client roster. Right. I think we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later because that's quite interesting. The, the idea that if you're doing brand work, you don't need the tracking in quite the same way if you're doing performance work. Let's come to the third member of our panel, Pete. Do you want a quick introduction on how you're seeing it at the moment? Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Pete Robbins. I'm currently having my own consultancy. Sorry, that's what it says here anyway. That's about helping businesses that um, lean heavily into ad tech media. I would describe myself as a media planner. So echoing what Jeremy and Sandra said. Uh, and in fact, um, I had the pleasure of working with Mr. Andrews back in the late 90s. So I've been doing agency side not in the six decades that he has, but uh, quite a fair amount of time. Um, I actually, taking a slightly different tack, I think I, I love disruption. I think um, the area that everybody on this call is interested in, because we're on this call, uh, disruption is the best thing that could possibly uh, happen right now. I think there's been some lazy planning that's come to market because it's convenient. There's also pressures on agencies to turn stuff around. So there's also, of course, the fact that um, but I think um, I'm an agency person through and through. I've sat on the IPA main council for the last several years. So I'm biased, except that I think this is a perfect time for um, agencies to reclaim some of the value that they've probably lost in recent years about exactly some of the stuff that Jeremy and Sandra have just been describing is that, um, and the point you just made, Simon, that not all inventory is the same, and some of this stuff would affect some businesses more than others. And I think that's exactly uh, the response agencies should have. I got, I'm not surprised at all there's going to be a delay because having met Google through the industry bodies, there's still a huge amount of confusion about what's going to happen. And I think actually it's a brilliant moment for us to um, define a, a modern future wave media plan. Okay, positivity as well as ageist. Um, that's, but quite interesting though, that point, isn't it? You know, that I think I agree that you know, it's a time for smart people to you know, do well here because we'll, we'll recreate something better than we had before. Because let's be honest, a lot of the stuff that you know, we're losing hasn't been great. But um, in that disruption, isn't the danger that um, our friends at Google, at Facebook, Google search and YouTube, in particular at Facebook or at Amazon benefit because people look for easy answers where, you know, because they're moving, money's moving around. It won't move just to Android, move elsewhere. So, Pete, do you just want to just cover that quickly? Yeah, I think the, there's, a, there's always been an argument for, um, or internal argument between advertisers about the, the difference between convenience and maybe what's best for them as a business. And that's, that's, I've never seen it not be the case, irregardless of the type of media. And what those, the, the businesses that you've just described, they made it incredibly easy for, 
those on the activation side to deploy those budgets through those channels. And um, as fees have gone down over the years and uh, specifically the time that people have, and this actually applies whether you've got an internal house within the client, the time that you have to deploy budget means you have this sort of constricting situation where um, you don't really have the time that you used to to plan properly. And I think what might happen is as a consequence of this, um, there's a huge amount of really valuable media stuff that exists out of those um, main players um, that, that means they're not the default. I mean, I had a situation, uh, I worked with some startups and early stage businesses where the VC business was saying to the uh, business they, they uh, invested in, where we assume all of this will be on Facebook. And I would say, well, that makes, that makes literally no sense. How can a VC know how to do media planning? But that was one of the conditions of the raise. And you think, well, that's, that's absurd. But I, I think um, I'd like to think that this might be a bit of a catalyst for people to possibly rethink about how they deploy the budget. And as Jeremy was, was, was alluding to, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, but the measurement piece is the fundamental thing that will change how we as planners or those in the planning uh, uh, role will think about how we deploy those budgets rather than just ones that are convenient. Jeremy, are you seeing that? Obviously, we talked last week, uh, the last session about, you know, the changes in attribution on the platforms you know, driven by this. So Facebook going from you know, 28 days to seven days, et cetera. Do you see that um, you know that shift to Google, Amazon, Facebook is you know a natural consequence? But you know, does measurement help them or does it hinder them? Um, I, well, I, I think the first part of the question um, in that you know is it do we see those um, platforms benefiting from these changes? I think the answer has to be yes, in in, in all likelihood. And that's part of the reason why we've seen this delay, haven't we, with, um, with the Google announcement last week is because there's this tension, I think, between um, what's in theory best for, for consumer privacy um, and what is potentially a regulatory or anti-competitive situation. So I think, you know, what the changes that have been suggested around things like Flock and so on um, are, you know, uh, in, in principle strong from a consumer privacy perspective, but they do definitely entrench those platforms' positions, um, and I think you know, it generally in the marketplace, if if there's less third-party data around, those platforms which have both scale and you know reams of first-party logged-in data, they're in a they're they're going to continue to be in a in, in a strong position. Um, and you know, Amazon, as I know, is an example. You you often talk about Simon in terms of being able to connect through exposure through to to purchase all within one one environment. Um, so I think from from a measurement point of view within those platforms, um, because everything is ultimately you know con connected to a large degree, they will certainly they will certainly benefit. Um, but you, the second part of your question about about measurement, I think what we're and maybe this was covered last week. Apologies, I missed it. So <laughs> hope I'm not repeating too much. Um, I think what we're seeing is 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 a is a kind of a fundamental shift away from trying to track individuals uh, and look at user journey type measurements through to more aggregated, uh, you know, higher, higher level measurement, which, um, which I think is ultimately a better way to look at things. I think we got obsessed with the, 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 the ability to be able to follow people. Um, and I think in many cases, you know, attribution being a good example, we ended up with a false view of actually, of causality. Um, we weren't really measuring the incremental effect of what was happening, um, but we were seeing something happen after something else and putting the two things together. Whereas more aggregated forms of measurement are, from a kind of methodological point of view, stronger ways to infer causality. We did go quite deep on that. I'll send you a copy of the last session you might find interesting. So, Sandra, the brands you're looking after again, you know, I guess you know, spend on those platforms. Um, and the benefit you, you have of the measurement there, you know, do you see that as a trend which is going to continue? Do you, you know, how do you feel? Is that a good thing or a bad thing to move to spend more money with the triopoly? 
I think I have to kind of agree whether we want to or not with Jeremy that, you know, the, the likes of Amazon, Facebook, Google, who have that, um, that kind of first party data and can offer data that goes through the whole consumer journey through to the end and, and eliminate some of that um, guesswork or that causality. Um, it will inevitably um, benefit. But I think there are new players coming to market in particular regions you, who, where you know, we've seen the rise of TikTok um, over the last 18 months and so on with their first party data, they also have an opportunity to offer the full consumer journey and then and act as a challenger. And I think what we will see over the, the next few months and, and sort of coming up to the next year and a half or two, um, I kind of, have to agree, you know, want to um, have sort of Pete's optimism that there will be more plan, more opportunities um, for more platforms to offer that full uh, full funnel um, tracking. And I think it really depends if we're, what side of the table you're on, whether you're a performance advertiser or a brand advertiser, what the impact of these changes are going to be. So, you know, if, if you're a performance advertiser, then obviously that first party data is key to being able to um, to 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 kind of deliver against your business's objectives but uh, sitting as a strategist around this table i think it's important i feel that we have a responsibility to get our clients to to rethink um how we measure um and rethink what 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 are the real kpis that make a difference to the bottom line to the business because it's it's those kpis and really thinking about are we just chasing an individual are we just chasing chasing an immediate action or you know what what are the bigger order the higher order kpis that are driving business growth that we should be prioritizing and focusing on just because we can measure individuals doesn't mean we should and doesn't mean that that's that should be the right way moving forward so i'd like to kind of i'd like you know you, you're, my aspiration would be that we take the next two years that google have given us and gifted us to to make a change and to think differently and, and rebuild better you know we've got an industry that we kind of cobbled together digital you know because we could measure everything we started measuring everything and so on and it was the right the way to do it but actually now that we have the luxury to of an opportunity to think about things and is it right it, you know is amazon offering the platforms that we want the engagement the consumer journeys that we want or are there new players in the market that that, that require a stronger or better role at the table or seat at the table right thank you i think that yeah, it's easy to sort of, you know, castigate Google, Amazon, Facebook being big and, you know, dominant, whatever, but they do a very good job for, you know, all their advertisers and, you know, people spending money on that do it wisely. And, and it, as, you know, Sandra says, it, there's TikTok, there's Snap, there's Pinterest, there's lots of others from there. Is there a danger, though, that as we move into this new world, you know, and we go to people who've got logged in people, first party data, logged in users, etc., from there, the open web starts to just, you know, diminish? So Aaron, you, from your point of view, you're, you're trading in this market from the open web and open apps, et cetera, from there. Um, do you think we're in danger of you know, losing some of the benefits we get if we can't find good ways of managing trading and tracking in this new environment? I mean, I mean it's a risk. I mean, just underscoring everything that, that Sandra, Jeremy and Pete have said, you know, we've had a history in the ad tech industry of, of showing ads where we can measure things, not necessarily where it matters. And if people don't start going through that adjustment phase, it, the three of them have talked about, we're going to throw money at UID tracking. We're going to throw money at the first party walled gardens. And it's going to be a diminished scale because even if you amalgamate all of those things together, it's still a fraction of what we deal with today. And again, you're going to get a very fragmented picture of it. You're going to sort of starve some of that, that mid tail, that long tail, the rest of the publisher ecosystem even on premium websites, I mean, the, the walled gardens of TikTok and Snap and et cetera aside, you know, not everybody's gonna log into the New York Times or Forbes or the Guardian and, and so forth. It'll be very fragmented. And, and again, you're in the risk as, as the three of them implied that if all you're doing is showing ads where you can measure it, you're not necessarily showing ads where you can maximize the impact. You know, and in many cases when we, I used to be in the performance advertising side on, on the online digital display side, you know, in the Critios of the world or, or the other retargeters of the world, you would double down in the highly measurable cookies that you could get the clicks off of, and you'd actually be targeting a, a tiny fraction of the overall retargeting pool on an e-commerce site. But you could measure them and you get the last touch on it, the last click or something. But when you actually did like an incrementality analysis, you know, you actually split the entire audience half and half, you'd see marginal incrementality because you're making a difference on an irrelevantly small pool of your audience. And when P&G or Audi 
or, or Unilever comes to any of us and says they want to make an impact, they don't want to make an impact on 1% of their potential audience, they want to have a scaled impact. And I think that strategy means that you have to reach across, you know, the four or five or 11 or so little tiny walled gardens you need to go beyond the 10 or 20% scale that UID or whatnot, or the alternative IDs are going to give us to try to have some sort of strategy that you can reach the wider web in a way that you can measure it and probably using some of those old fashioned techniques of like regional holdouts or audience holdouts rather than directly measuring every single individual cookie or device. I think it's interesting, isn't it? You know, you mentioned P&G. There's a quote I used from the P&G CMO who was talking in London I think about 18 months ago. And they talked about them moving from broad and generic demographic targets like women 18 to 49, which is still what you buy on television, so still shapes lots of that, to smart audience with precision and scale. First time moms, new homeowners, new washing machine owners, like TV watches. So you don't need to know something at an individual level to be in there. You just want to know, do they fit into those groups? Because I think you're right. If I'm p and selling washing powder, I need to get millions of people to want to buy my product, not one-to-one -one from there. It's controversially a little bit in opposition to that. I mean, I think that's a good aspiration. But today, the way that you would satisfy that is through cookies and maids, where you know that this person just bought a dishwasher. And I don't think that that's going to be a scalable strategy going forward. You need to look at sort of other ways of getting to that audience through proxies that are, are scalable, that don't require personal identity. So Pete, we talked a little bit about this in the prep call the other day. Um, you know, the long tail is going to disappear because the long tail is driven by third party cookies doesn't add much value. You know, premium publishers in that open web have some relationship with their users, but Aaron points out they don't ask you just bought a washing machine. They, they've got a more general sense from that. So it, it starts to lead to, you know, we want groups of people we can identify as proxies which is good old fashioned advertising before the web, isn't it, I guess? Uh, yes. So as you will recall, without trying to be joking aside, in the early days of when we were literally making stuff up, then there was no cookie tracking. And in fact, the only way that we could target, there was no ad serving, as you know, it was uh, looking the environment that an ad was theoretically being served. And in fact, you know, back then there was no, all we were looking for was a, was a call to a server to say that the ad file had been uh, requested. So, but the way that we did that was to look at where those ads were. Obviously, the market was significantly smaller, and we were only dealing with publishers. There was no um, third market. So, yes, some of those some of those standard media planning tactics are applicable to nearly every channel. But there are a whole host of um, uh, newer techniques that have developed over the years entirely because of the ability for us to more uh, more closely validate a delivery and more validate its cause and effects. And uh, I, I think regardless of some of the tech that will be available or some of the cookies tracking that will be available, um, I, I tend to talk about relevancy at scale. So how far do you go down the relevancy and how far do you go to the scale? And there's clearly a, a graph there for different advertisers mean different things. And it's related to the price that you're willing to pay. So you've got a three-dimensional thing that will probably fluctuate as you see in most media. There's not always a fixed cost. And understanding the relationship between those, as you and me have talked so many times about over endless cups of coffee, what you then show to somebody is still the most important thing. So if we're able to um, even if in the next two years, as, a, as, a, as an industry, we get better at using whatever information is available just to nudge the piece of creative that people can watch, read, listen to, whatever, to make it slightly more relevant, performance will go up. Whether that is a, um, a high cadence short-term business, so they need, they need short-term performance, or whether it's something over a period of time, maybe like an Audi, um, where actually you're, you're doing a different job but you're still going to measure it at some point. It's probably a bit further down the line. So as, as Aaron was saying, you're looking at different proxies. And that has to be, like I said it before, it has to be reflected in the media planning. Um, I think we'll move to, uh, and that's, I think nearly everybody's saying this, we're moving back towards uh, information that sits where the ad is served. So it might be on page, or it might be the first party data that sits with that media owner, as opposed to a third party. And I'm, really pleased about that because that seems to be more exciting aligned to those advertisers that have some of their own data because 
people talk about advertising first party data. There's a lot of people that don't have any first party data. So um, there are obviously some bridging technologies that are coming to market about how you link that up. But if you can use that and shape the patterns of how you spend, shape the creative you're uh, delivering so it's, it's more relevant, do it at scale that's relevant to the client. And crucially, as we've said, put the right measurement criteria. And Sandra said, it, you know, what is the criteria? And it varies for every single client. There's no standard answer. You, you have to feel that's a better way to go about how we spend our clients' money. Okay. So I think, so if I could just add on that point, I think the, I think the promise of, um, of contextual as a, as a sort of way forward um, through this um, is, is really, seems really powerful to me. I think both from the consumer perspective, I think one of the problems that we've kind of got into is this disconnect between the ad communication and the environment in which it, it's served. Um, and I think from, you know, if you think about, you know, magazines, historically, you know, Vogue or what have you, the advertising was arguably as important as the, as the content in which it was placed. Um, but that's really not been the case uh, in, in digital advertising in the last 10 plus years. So I think from a consumer perspective, contextual is, is really powerful. And then I think from the publisher perspective, particularly some of the premium publishers who've really lost out, news publishers I'm thinking of in particular, um, it really allows them the opportunity to, to monetize their audience properly. And I know, again, Simon, you often talk, talk about, um, you know, The Guardian and you look at their print edition and all the, you know, big established premium brands. I mean, you go to their website and you see completely the opposite. Yeah. But it feels as though the, the contextual um, approach is, is potentially offers benefits, I think, for both, both consumers and, and some of those publishers who have really lost out. I yeah, and I think the risk is that we run down, we all run down a road where we're all after first party data because we're all short of first party data. So, you know, to Pete's point, lots of advertisers that sitting that we're having conversations with don't necessarily have a huge fountain of first party data. And it becomes and it, the risk is that we it becomes a race to the bottom um, of you know how, what audiences can I can I have a connection with rather than are they the right audiences and what's the right what's the value exchange. Um, um, because ultimately there's a, there will be a certain profile of person who's happy to give their data um, and over time we'll have more and more of the same kind of people that we're able to target and if we then just spend our time chasing after the same kind of people you'll you, you know to Aaron's point we we end up um, focusing too much on the on the very few and driving lots of focus on the on the few rather than the many right so uh, what we're also agreeing on there's lots of the things are going to be important. So contextual is going to be important, but it can't be on. There's not enough contextual content to make it work just on its own. First party data is going to be, going to be important. We're going to need a sort of tapestry of different ways of doing this, aren't we? There isn't going to be I just do third party cookies and job done. It's going to be harder work and find lots of different things. I am fascinated by the quarter news publishers and the work they're doing you know, to build first party data, and you sort of feel that the one people who should do better out of this are the quarter newspapers who create great content, but the programmatic world has found a way of you know, avoiding spending money with them. I can reach an FT reader on Yahoo Mail or on eBay rather than on FT and save them a lot of money. So I feel like there's a benefit there of getting that fixed. But let's think about that all these solutions out there. Everyone's talking about you know, Google and cohorts and universal IDs. What was quite interesting, I thought, was the, the, the blog post where Google announced their delay there was, you know, it wasn't very long, but one paragraph in there said, we will not support other means of tracking in our sort of ecosystem. So, you know, it feels like the idea is that you can get someone's email and use that as a universal ID or whatever from there. All feel that, you know, just try to replicate the past and look like that Google isn't gonna allow those to happen. So it's probably not gonna fly. Do you have a point of view about the universal IDs and cohorts of general sense? Sandra, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I think, uh... I think there is no, to your first point, you know, I think there is no one solution. The solution, the answer isn't A, the same for every advertiser, and B, isn't going to be, the, there isn't one solution that, that fixes the problem. I think coupled with what you've just quoted from Google, you've also got the Apple, um, is sort of yeah. find my address or my email address, so hide my email address, which will make it inherently difficult, you know, virtually to not say impossible to do to take the same approach. So what we do need is that fresh stance, and I think it brings us back to the days of you know thinking about 
how does modeling how does how do yeah, how can we model um what drives business returns and and it will be a more sophisticated way shall we say of of bringing together all the different tools that we have to hand it will be a mix uh, you know i think for all of our clients it will be a mix and i think but there will be a journey that we all need to go down to to see what tech sticks um what works and and it's a journey that we're all going to be part of um i think there are lots of offerings currently on the table that we're all trialing um, everyone's trying to to find the kind of golden answer but i think the reality is that for our clients for a lot of our clients it's going to be a bespoke solution that's very tailored to to their to their market i think you know we, we can all talk about ids and the importance of it uh, ids and and scaling that and that first party data and how they play into each other and so on but i think ultimately it's going to be a mix of those and i think the modeling will be how we model our businesses and what drives that bottom line ultimately will be what's key whether i'm a brand advertiser or a performance advertiser okay so aaron you, you you're in the sort of you know the canary in the coal mines because so you've already made some changes to the way you approach identifying people, you know, building on top of location. Do you want to talk about what you've done there? Yeah, I mean, it follows very, very reasonably from what Sandra was saying. I couldn't agree with her more. Uh, effectively, we need to use whatever identity is available, but we're either going to have a lot or none or something halfway between that. Um, so what we do is, is it probably makes a very pragmatic sense, which is where we have an identity, we treat it as a consumer panel. It's this like advertising concept of a hundred years ago, which is like the Nielsen family, you know, the people that you're able to measure, that you're able to understand that informs the media plan that you can even extrapolate through modeling through cohort sort of technologies or strategies across the wider, wider audience. So we'll use universal IDs where we see them. We'll use IDFAs and other maids and so forth or cookies when we see them. But I think we also need to have a plan where we can try to find the characteristics of that audience that we can find without the personal data that goes more broadly. So for example, just a concrete example, given sort of the device IDs that we see in the wild, the people that go into an Ikea or a Tesco, we can sort of find out roughly the areas that they live or where they work. We understand the characteristics of those areas. We understand what these people that we've directly observed, sort of that consumer panel, the type of content they consume online, the categories of it. And then we can kind of assemble those contextual signals in a way that doesn't require the device entity. This person's reading a sports article on The Guardian on a Sunday in Mayfair, they're probably eligible for, for an Audi advertisement, or they're doing these other things. And the more that you can sort of blend these different factors together, I think the richer your strategy will be. If you're only chasing identities, whether it's the UID or device ID or cookie, you're going to be fishing in a small pond. Everybody's going to be fishing there. The economics of it, I mean, CPMs are going to drive up. It's going to be harder to reach it at scale. Conversely, just like the Alternative, well, let's just, you know, let's just trust Google and trust, trust Facebook and so forth. I, I think there's a lot of value in what agencies do to sort out this complexity for clients. The more that everybody just sort of says, well, just let's just let the, the walled garden sort this out, the harder it is to differentiate, to provide value, to really deliver meaningful results back to the ultimate client on that. Um, so I think everybody's sort of invested in a, a multi-platform strategy uh, and then strategy where you're looking at where you have IDs, you use them, where you don't have IDs, you, you try to have a strategy that uses modeling, uh, both with measurement as well as the targeting and activation optimization around it. It's interesting, isn't it? The idea that, because one of the problems with you know, the way that Facebook has evolved now is that you know, their machine learning works out how to find customers that's interesting for you, and they do it very well, but no one sort of knows, well, what, what rules did they use that we could apply elsewhere? It's a, it's a black box in every sense, isn't it? So, yeah, and I guess in a walled garden, you know, Facebook has a lot of data, but it's usually that, that lookalike modeling is you find specific cookies that look like other specific cookies, but it, it all presupposes that you have cookies. Um, there aren't really that many techniques that are sort of taking, let's call it fingerprinting, but not doing it to find other cookies or other devices, but audience proxies, audience prototypes, or sort of cohorts that are built up using modeling, using the characteristics of the audience, rather than the specific cookies in that audience. We're kind of moving to the sort of post DMP world where we're not exchanging bags of cookies and bags of maids, but you know concepts of what makes up the fundamentals of that audience based on the signals that we can see in the programmatic ecosystem that we can buy off of. So Jeremy, that's sort of your bread and butter, isn't it? I guess You're trying to you know elicit some meaning from the data you've got in different places and you know make it transportable to somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think. Um... Yeah, in, in terms of the, I mean, it goes back to your question or your point about PNG and and uh, you know different how you define different audiences. I mean, I guess what we're 
what we're generally trying to do is look at, um, you know, from different sources, uh, trying to understand what are the characteristics that are most influential or most imp important for a particular advertiser and, and their needs. Um, so, you know, I you know, as Aaron's describing, you know, location is certainly one of those variables that can act as a, a means of tying lots of different things together and give insights about, you know, what's important for different for different advertisers, um, for sure. Um, but to go back to go back to your point about um, Google uh, and Flock uh, and whether they're going to support other other you know things like um, fingerprinting and other other universal ID type approaches. I, I think the big thing that's still obviously unknown here is is the effect of regulation, isn't it? It's because it, it was, while Google may not want to support those um, types of technologies or approaches, they may at some point be be forced to. I think from in, from a competition perspective, or at least have pressure on them to enable a, a wider um, you know ecosystem to to develop. Well, I think the regulation thing, you know, it's hard to keep up with, isn't it? You know, who's suing Google about what in which part of the world now from there? And it's interesting that, you know, you've got one element of the EU, I think, is, you know, talking to Google about they shouldn't be using um, cookies because of privacy. Another part of is saying you shouldn't be withdrawing cookies because it's, um, uh, you know, it interrupts other people's business. So you almost, it's that stupid to say, you almost feel sorry for Google. That's a stupid thing to say, but you know they're sitting there. They've got a very healthy business we'd like to continue to um, and maintain. They have to work out how do you do that in a world where Apple is setting the privacy rules. Um, but then they have regulation. Then they have you know every other competitive pressure. Someone pointed out that by the time um, they bring in, they remove because the end of twenty twenty three, the California Privacy Act will come into place six months before that. So they won't be able to run their business under the California rules and stands. So it's getting terribly complicated. Um, Pete, do you have a point of view? You know, where would do we think that the ideal Google solution comes out? Is it did, did Flock make sense to you? The idea of cohorts? Is it finessing that they need to do, or is it something more fundamental? I'll be honest, I don't know, actually. Um, to your point, some of this stuff, I mean, I've sat through. I mentioned earlier, I sat through IPA meetings with ISBAR and IAB, and you leave and you think, right, I'm actually more confused at the start of the meeting. That just might be my inability to keep up. But when you get some of the legal people representing, say, Google or Facebook, and, and you think, right, this is really complicated because there's so many different parts of consequence. So that's the first thing. I think from a um, intuitively, with my media planning head on, uh, as we've been describing, moving away from a, um, a, a, a large number of individuals to a manageable group of individuals that have some relativeness to each other intuitively feels like the right thing to do because um, there comes a point with any media planning where the the activation becomes so complicated, so time consuming, so, so costly, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, as you and me have discussed, we've rarely seen anything where the idea of not doing something at aggregate level makes sense because the return. So either you've, and again, we've talked about this, sort of the, 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 um, the downside of digital media planners is they like to take a budget and then minimize it because they've got a CPA, but they've only deliver three customers for the client and you think that's not successful but they give that was the CPA I was given that I've got that you get no they need to scale and sometimes the CPA has to reflect that and it's probably not one CPA because not all the customers are the same so I think the idea of cohorts or aggregate numbers of of, of people that um, you can identify as have, have been worth reaching I mean there might be a point where you say unless you're confident about you really want to serve an ad don't do it just because you can. It's very hard to say to a client, we're actively going to spend a lot of time deciding not to serve any ads because it's not worth it. Um, uh, or saying to a client, I'm going to try and buy the most expensive media I can for you because I'm confident that people will reach in as a relevance to you as a business. So it's really important we get those. And those ones over there have very little value. So unless we can buy them at a cheap price, we're not going to bother. And that's where a cohort or aggregate um, approach enables you to manage that and to be fair also allows people to understand what's going on 
because everyone wants to work faster than they used to. Uh, so there has to be a semblance of practically how do you get client agency, ad tech, media owner, supply side working in a way that allows that to happen. And I don't have the answer for that yet. But I think Sandra mentioned it earlier that I think the response is most likely to be it's how you approach what you do is probably more important than what you do at the moment. Yeah, so look, just quick reminder to everyone, we've got about um, uh, 15 minutes to go. We're open for questions. So if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. If you've got a point of view, uh, I want to add something, put it in the chat and we'll share that as well from there. Just so building on what Pete said that, you know, what we're moving to with the cohorts um, is is those pen portraits of, of the olden times, you know, when we built yeah, pen portraits good. of our audiences and then and then targeted those individuals. And I think really the answer of whether it's right or wrong depends on what the cohorts that we're able to choose from or able to build what they look like and and what value they offer because ultimately they'll only be as good as the return that they offer advertisers and clients and how refined we can be without going down the same individual rabbit hole of three people that that we've been going down in the past so i think it is about aggregating into mac sort of larger cohorts without going too far and not going far enough but i think you know it, the, the solution will be bespoke you know it'd be for each advertiser yeah i mean i think i think the principle of cohorts cohorts is is pretty sound isn't it i mean it's it's not fundamentally any different from interest-based groups that we've targeted through you know third-party data or you know other forms of targeting that we've done using you know tgi or survey-based data um i think the the challenge i suppose is the fact that it is quite opaque as to how those cohorts come together um, and I think my understanding at least is that those cohorts are, are, are changing very rapidly as well. So trying to get a, a, a feel for the validity of them is, is, a, is, a, is potentially a bit challenging, although presumably that comes through from, you know, testing and seeing what happens. It's quite interesting. I was talking to Permutive, who do lots of work with publishers, and they're telling me that, you know, they're helping them understand who their audience is and categorise them and make it sort of, you know, valuable because the categories they can sell to people. But they're saying the IAB is working on sort of taxonomy because if you New you, York Times thinks that you know, SUV drivers are a certain way, but the Guardian thinks it's slightly different, that's not much good to us if you're planning Audi. But if you know that both the you know the Guardian and New York Times and whoever else has a similar view of SUV drivers, it allows you to actually I'll just go around and buy those everywhere. So mm. you know, it feels like the building blocks are sort of coming back, and there are lots to come from you know previous years. The other thing that's quite interesting, you know, Google, Amazon, you know, big advertisers now in traditional advertising. You know, one wonders if things like the YouTube um, homepage takeover, the masthead there, you know, which has huge reach, you know, we're moving more to actually, there will be things you will buy that have a big audience reach without very much targeting, because it's quite a good statement. So Sandra, I imagine that your clients are still very keen on the first spread in Vogue or in Vanity Fair, et cetera. And there's, in the traditional world, there's lots of places you want to be because you know they're the right place to be for your brand. We tend not to have those in the digital world because we've all been chasing one to one. Absolutely. And I think we have the opportunity now to build a world where we we balance those two, you know, because yes, in different media channels, we were taking a very different approach. And I think it's um, it's we need to move to a world where we in, create a new way of approaching media that isn't just uh, iterating what we've already had you know I think we've got an opportunity now to kind of build something new that's fit for the future rather than just adapting and iterating and I think you know if we look back to when the first announcements were made you know we knew this was coming it was a, a mitigating the effect of that and I think now we have the opportunity and we should be all looking at you know how do we not mitigate, but actually create something that that is really fit for for the for our, for new consumer journeys and new co and new consumer behaviours, because everything's changing. Aaron's got a word of warning for us. Do you want to share that, Aaron? I just think I hope we don't reinvent ad networks. Like here's an idea: we find a bunch of publishers with first party data, and we add a layer on top of that that makes it all packaged up. Uh, there are a lot of um, um, trapdoors here, aren't there? I think, but, but actually, learning from the past, you know, before we could do one to one and all the things you know, we've talk, we know become familiar, you know, that learning from there would make sense. And Pete mentioned creative before; it's a you know something I spent a huge, huge amount of time. You know, if we can make the creative better, and part of that is having better formats as well, and they're in places where we know the audience is, it feels like 
you know, we're building some building blocks that help people make the most of this environment rather than we're just sort of struggling to try and actually what's a workaround so I can chase someone around the web because I looked at something in John Lewis last week. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot here. It almost feels like a moral issue. It's good and bad. Who wants to actually, you know, make, but at the end of the day, it's economics. At the end of the day, brands are going to do well if we can sell stuff for them um, and if we stop annoying people. Which, I mean, I think that comes back to the point I was trying to make earlier about contextual being quite promising, I think, because to your point about chasing people around the web, that was a function of the fact that the advertising and the and the editorial environment got essentially separated. And I think when we talk about trying to make, you know, a new form of creative format or, new, or become more creativity or, or inject more creativity into, into our uh, advertising, I think a big part of that is about the advertising being more congruent with the environments in which it's placed and being more sensitive to why people are on that particular website or doing whatever they're doing because ultimately advertising is still going to be interruptive isn't it so if we can do that in a way that's more sensitive to why someone's in that particular place then that's got to be a good thing well i think that makes perfect sense. warren from verizon hi warren has asked a good question in the chat yeah i'll paraphrase it you can read it but basically you know contextual advertising you know can be made to work. Do we think that people truly value the idea of context? Or, you know, do we more want to be addressed with all these ideas solutions? It feels like the balance to be had and context has been underplayed really, doesn't it? I mean, I think there's been a lot of people talking about contextual as at least we have that. Um, but again, the thinking about it as contextual was, was much more prevalent a decade ago. But um, I'm not familiar with the next gen audiences, but you know, I guess part of what we've built is kind of this hyper contextual thing as well, which is you don't want to just target football pages. You don't want to target just things that talk about LeBron James. You need to look at a combination of signals. And I think where we are now relative to a decade ago, I think to Sanders point of we need to evolve is we are much better as an industry at using copious amounts of data to really sort of surgically refine targeting criteria. So I think contextual as a, well, let's just show a trainer's ad on a football page. I don't think that worked then. I don't think it's going to work now, but we can go beyond that using contextual signals. Yeah, it's like there's always there's, it's in between where we were and where we are now, isn't it? How can we use the technology and cleverness we've got in a smart way to build on context rather than just ignore it? And I'll talk to whoever looks at that page, sports page. I'll go find them when they're doing their email or from you know wherever they are. I'll go bother with an ad then, which doesn't make any sense at all, I think. So it feels like it's a challenging time for agencies because um, for everybody involved in this because it feels like this is going to be quite a lot of hard work it's not going to be as easy as it was um but can this hard work be made to you know work better for clients can you know still lots of avatar we talked to are not that convinced by digital because they think they're paying for traffic and results they would have got anyway organically you know you get that sort of context with retargeting brand search etc from there so do we need to do a better job of proving to people that digital advertising you know, can really pay off and actually drive you know, business results? Because we've all seen that. Sandra, to ask you, do your clients, you know, do they really buy into digital or do they sort of do it reluctantly? How do they feel about digital? And do you think this is a chance to get to reframe it for them? I think, yeah, I think there's an opportunity to reframe it. And I think, bundle you're saying does it who believes in digital you know there's so many different digital environments and different yeah. ways of using it i think that there's no one straight answer but i think the to your point about where we go from here and it's it, it's going to be hard work i think i i can agree with that i think i, I think everybody around the table you know, is aware that it's going to take a refresh. It's going to take some long, hard thinking about how our businesses, how our clients' businesses are built and how our businesses play into that. Um, but it also, it's about, there's going to be a journey that we go through in terms of, you know, what, what is the answer for particular, for agencies and what is the answer for our clients? You know, what delivers the greatest return? I don't think it's a case of proving digital. It's about, you know, how digital plays into the full ecosystem. Um, and delivers business returns because ultimately um, that's what will be focused and um, 
focused on and accountable to. And I think the journey that will go on as as as, as industry as an in, a collective industry, whether you're a specialist team and buying the digital campaigns, or whether it's a strategist or whatever side of the table you're on, it's about understanding. You know, what are we trying to do? You know, what are the KPIs that we're going to be measuring? Because until we start thinking about and we're accountable for different whilst we're accountable to pete's point about my cpa you know i achieved your cpa wasn't that what you wanted you know like until we we break away from people micro um delivering smaller chunks of of the journey um we're never we're not going to find the right solution so i think it's a journey that we all need to go on but it's going to be hard work yeah and it's about bravery it's about being brave in a difficult time i think well, fortune favours the brave, which is I'm trying to optimistic. So, Pete, you're you're advising startups now about this. You've got the VCs funneling money to Facebook because that's what everyone does. You know, do, do you think the agency world and again your IPA former hat on are they well set up to do this hard work, or will it be some will and some won't? Um, well. I now I've left the IPA. I can tell you, so I always used to say that um, in talking to the guys, I. You spend too much time with the is bar because so I think of it in thirds. So I think a third of ages and agencies are exceptional, a third are all right, and a third aren't. But it's the same on the advertiser side. And I bet Jeremy and Sandra have got stories about clients that you within your cup, which you wish you'd never worked with. And there's other you can't say that obviously publicly. And there's ones you think I would work, I would bend over backwards because they're just brilliant to work with. So um, you know, you've got different, different um because we're, we're, we're in a people business, you advertise as a people business, whether you're a client agency side, you work in ad tech, um, and there's lots of really brilliant people. There's also some people that are quite frankly incompetent. So you're always going to have that mix. And I think you said right up front, as Sandra was saying, it's going to be hard work, but definitely the, the smarter people and the smarter advertisers, the smarter, I mean, they will rise to the top, I would hope, because that's the way it should be. And I think that is, um, again, I'm really positive about this. I think this it's um it's a great time to be doing what we're doing um because I've never seen more pressure on advertisers to have a a more um risk averse route to spend in their media investment, particularly after what happened last year when you know, the market fell off a cliff when the first thing people did was to pull advertising because they weren't sure what to do. And you could immediately see those advertisers that didn't have the confidence in their spend was delivering a return. Now, obviously, there were some businesses where you know, that stopped, but there was others that we were saying, uh, actually, the COVID thing hasn't really affected you. You could you could carry on. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to because it's, you know, it's money to stop. You're thinking, okay, then there's been a failure for those businesses to understand the, the role of that investment. Uh, and to Sandra's point, and Jeremy's the same thing, that the, the the opportunity, I think, without any shadow of a doubt, was regardless of whether it's digital or what ITV are doing with Planet B or what Global are doing with their uh, audio and out of home or all four or you know, the Ozone project. Oh, you could name so many people outside of Facebook and Google and TikTok and Amazon that are, that are being uh, quite innovative about how their, their reach can be more uh, deterministically deployed. I think it's absolutely fascinating opportunity for those that don't just work in one channel to shape how our clients spend their bu their budget, and particularly those early stages, you have to get to a proof point to get the next you know round of funding. So you it, the pressure you can't mess it up because if you don't, they go out of business. So that's when the pressure really counts, and they have to do something that's um, uh, cause uh, is causal to that spend. And I, I I think that's that way of working. I think is going to become famous last words more um, prevalent, regardless of whether you're. A, or next round of funding whether you're an established business right so we're almost out of time um i think we've got a positive view which i, I wanted to get i think you know lots of people are optimistic about this i know we are i know bliss are optimistic about these changes that you know we can get a better business which will drive much better value for our clients which will support the people who create all the content and the platforms etc from there i think we've made a good point that there are loads of people out there you may not have been working with you know that are worth talking to to understand what's out there because it won't be one size fits all you need to find a tapestry of different things from different people so you should be spending so we've got an extra year now from google spend that time you know understanding what potential partners are working from there but i want one sort of just wild card to throw out because the one thing that you know i think 
we're all agreed hard work and the right attitude will, will do well here. The one thing um, that's going to make a change is regulation. We've all mentioned that. So quickly, in sort of 30 seconds, what would you like a regulator to do which would make a digital advertising better? It's probably a bit utopian, but I think greater alignment across territories. So we've got some consistency because that feels to me one of the fundamental tensions that with the global tech companies and any EU regulation here and obviously their own regulation in their own markets. Yeah, that's a good that, point. That, that think, helps, that just slows everything down. Yeah, that's a good point. Especially the UK not being part of the EU or whatever, you know, with our own. <laughs> okay, so some, 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 yeah, a level playing field. Okay, Sandra, Pete, who wants to go next? I think democratization. You know, we can't have one player owning the plumbing, the railways, the you know, the, the whole infrastructure. So a bit of democratization, a bit of a level playing field, because that's what's going to allow that long tail, the other players coming into the market and having a fair shot. Okay, great. Aaron? Pete? Amazing. Jeremy and Sandra both said probably the most clever things that any of us can say, which is greater alignment across regulations. Um, DPO on that Bliss reports in Deni, she's an absolute hero, she might even be here, but having to deal with Brazil and South Africa and the various things in America, it, it's, it does your head in. Um, and then it would be nice to have that even playing field. I guess the one other thing I would add on to that, I mean, I, th I think there's going to be a period of a couple of weeks where we just blindly ignore that privacy is even a thing as we recover from the Google announcement, but privacy is still a thing. We need to take it seriously. And I guess part of what the regulators now need to step up is despite whatever Google might be doing, we still need to care about privacy. Our brands care about privacy. You know, I know the RFIs we get from some of the agencies like here, you know, they are reflecting what their brands are telling them, which is they don't want to be caught up in controversy of people misusing mm -hmm. data. They want to be on the right side of that customer dialogue, that consumer dialogue. And it's on us to make sure that we respect privacy going forward and, and don't just take this as business as usual. The, to the winds of change, the tone of consumers is clearly going in a direction. And Google might have given us time, governments and consumers may not have. Right. Have you got anything to add? Uh, it might be what Sandra said in different words is don't, if you're a regulator, I have seen this, don't just defer to what the two or three biggest people say. Yes. Yes, it's regulation, the teams at these places are lobbyists. So look, time's up. I'm conscious there's a football match happening later. Appreciate everyone taking time out to come and talk with us. Um, we're addictive bliss. We're very optimistic about this. I think the three sessions we've had with you know, the brightest and best from agencies are talking about this. There is so much good stuff being done, being talked about, and with some hard work and dedication, we can actually make you know, some real positive benefits. We're going to share a video of the session um, tomorrow or after. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, then reply back to that and share that from there. Um, we'd love to keep talking with everybody about this. It's not going to go away, but, you know, Fortune favours the brave, and that's up to all of us to go take advantage of this. And I am convinced that if you're smart about this and you take competitive advantage, you'll win out of those other people who are like deer stuck in the headlights, who are celebrating the fact they can keep going with third party clues for a while longer. It will separate you know, winners from losers. But thank you for your time, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.